In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Well, we have come to the, the first of the last three Sundays of this calendar year of the church year, not the calendar that we all otherwise use, but there are three Sundays left in the season after Pentecost, and then Advent will begin in another church year. These last three Sundays, the theme is, all go, is going to be about last things, the end of of uh, the end of things, the coming of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew likes to call it in his gospel. This has become a rather popular uh, thing for people to think about these days with things like the Left Behind series and the like, which I need to tell you is really bad theology. Uh, this concept of something called the rapture is um, it's a product of bad biblical interpretation coupled with a very active imagination. But it's not at all what either Jesus or the other writers in the New Testament are talking about. Our epistle is probably the key scripture that the people who believe in the rapture take. And I want to take a minute to unpack what Paul is really saying. Now, the context for this in his letter to the Thessalonians was their question which was, Jesus hasn't returned yet, we're still waiting, and some of our people have died already. Are they going to miss out? And so Paul was writing to reassure them that, in fact, any person who had died in Christ would not miss out at all. That's why he's saying, when the time comes, and you know the, the Lord will come with the sound of a voice of command and the sound of a trumpet, etc., and the dead will rise first and come to greet the Lord. And then he goes on to say, and we who are left will, uh, will come and join Christ in the air. Now that's where the, the uh, rapture people got this idea of people being pulled up out of the earth. But what Paul is actually describing is a, uh, is, is a practice that would have been well known to his, his uh, listeners and readers. That's, <clears throat> the word he uses to describe Jesus' return is in Greek, parousia. And it, it means return, but it was used specifically to describe the return of a triumphant king or warrior. And what would happen when the triumphant king returned was that his followers and subjects and, and admirers would go out to meet the returning king outside the city gates and escort him in to take back his, resume his throne, you know, in triumph and all of that. And this is exactly what Paul is, is describing, that Jesus would descend from heaven to earth to take up his reign on earth with the full realization of the kingdom of God and that all of his followers, us, the church, would meet him, i.e. in the air, and escort him down to earth where his reign will begin. So it's not an escape away from earth, but actually a bringing of heaven and earth together and the final consummation of God's promises happening. That's what Paul is describing. You know, the thought that a God of love would choose some people to be punished and go through terrible torture while other people watched and presumably laughed or something is just not the kind of God we've come to know. It's it's a rather strange and unusual way of looking at it. But that's what Paul is describing, is his metaphorical take on what that process when the final consummation of God's kingdom comes, what it would be like. Now the gospel reading is doing the same thing. Jesus is telling a parable. This is the second of four parables that in Matthew's gospel where Jesus talks about the end of things and what will happen. Now, in this story also, he's using a, a metaphor. He's using the, a, the image of <clears throat> a wedding feast. Now, in, in their culture and the time, the way a wedding happened, they're not like we do them today where we you know, come to a church or some beautiful glen or something and have a religious ceremony and a big party. Part of that's true. They did have a big party. But the way a wedding worked was that 
The friends of the bride and the like would gather at the bride's home and await the coming of the bridegroom. The bridegroom would come and, and meet his wife, and then there would be a procession with all the people from the bride's house to the groom's house. That procession itself was the wedding, and then there would be the party. Now, so what the story is being described here is they've been waiting at the bride's house for the bridegroom to come, and for some reason the bridegroom has been delayed, and so they're waiting. They don't know when he's going to come, but they, and it's later than they expected. Now, in the story, he says there are ten bridesmaids. These are attendants, and five of them are wise and five of them are foolish. The foolish, he says, brought no oil, extra oil for their lamps, while the wise, uh, while the wise maidens brought extra oil for their lamps in flasks. Now, if you're wondering what we're talking about, I actually have a prop here today. This, this little thing here is a replica first century oil lamp. This is what, um, this is what they're, they're describing, is this little thing here, you pour olive oil into the well here. There's a wick that comes out the end. You light the wick, and it's essentially a first century flashlight. And that's what we're talking about here. So when the bridegroom suddenly appears at midnight, and they all get up to trim their lamps, and the foolish maidens have no oil, and their lamps are going out, there, they have no light, and they turn to the wise ones and say, Please lend us some oil. And they say, we've got just enough. You're going to have to go out and buy. Now, I don't know where you're going to buy oil in, um, in the Middle East at midnight in those days. Who's got the 24-hour um, oil concession? I don't know. But, you know. So they go out looking for it. And while they're out looking, the bridegroom arrives. All the people who are there and ready form the procession and go off into to the groom's where, they, where the wedding party begins and the doors are closed. And then what, finally these five not-so-wonderful, foolish maidens get their oil and they arrive. The doors are closed and they're knocking on the door, let us in, let us in. And the voice from inside says, I don't know who you are. And they don't get in. Now, this can be a frightening story, but it's really not that frightening. What did the maidens, what exactly happened to the maidens in the story? Was it because they weren't ready? Yeah, to a degree, but what they were not ready for was the delay. They were actually ready for the bridegroom hours before. They weren't ready to wait until he got there. And because of that, when the time came, then they found themselves not prepared. So it's not really that we have to stay awake and never fall asleep. Everybody fell asleep. It's that you know, Jesus is saying, and the word he uses at the end, it's translated keep awake, but better translation, I think, is watch, you know, which is pay attention, be ready. The kingdom could come at any time, and when it does, you need to be ready. So, of course, this is a... Metaphor: We don't really have to be carrying oil around with us. It's not really going to be a wedding banquet like it. It'll be a good party you won't want to miss. But what is? What is that extra oil we're supposed to carry with us? Something that will be there when the time actually comes, whenever it comes, which we never know when it may be. It would have to be something that would not give out, something that would last, something that we could always count on. And I, I would say that St. Paul gave us the answer in the first letter to the Corinthians, you know, in that wonderful ode to love. You know, if I have, uh, uh, when he talks about, it's always read at weddings anyway, right? You know, if I speak in the tongue of men and angels, but I don't have love, I'm nothing, right? And he goes on, but he, he, he says towards the end, that there are three things that endure forever, faith, hope, and love, those three things. And the greatest of those is love. So really, if we're going to fill up our flask with something, 
that will last until whatever, whenever Jesus might appear, then those are the things. Faith, not understood as doctrine, but trust. To trust that God's promise will be fulfilled even if I can't see it now. Hope, living into the reality that what we have and see now is not the fullness of what God has promised, that we will experience it whenever it is. And living in that hope and not succumbing to fear and loathing and love. That not romantic love, but God's kind of love, that self-giving, caring love that wants health and wellness and kindness for everyone. Now, if we live our lives with faith, hope, and love, whenever the time might come, we will be ready. We will have everything for our lamp and be ready to accompany our Lord to the kingdom. Finally, because of today, of what today is, I don't not everybody here will remember what happened 25 years ago, but I do. Um, and this was 25 years ago today, the Berlin Wall, quote, fell, but actually was thrown open. All the gates were opened up, and it was the end of the, um, the division of Germany, which had gone on for 44 years from the end of World War II. And I remember when it happened, you know, all the joy and the celebrating, but there was a video from the, uh, the German parliament that was taken at the time of it. And you have to remember, they had no idea this was going to happen, when it would happen or what. They had been hoping for that for years and years and years. And it shows them, you know, doing their ordinary, boring legislative business sitting there and, you know, talking. And somebody came running into the chamber, breathless, breathlessly announced that the East German government had thrown open the gates, the wall was gone, Germany was reunited. And you watch the people, they just, they dropped things on the floor, they stood up and they started singing. It was such an explosion of joy to experience something they had hoped for for so long. Now that's what the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom of God will be like for us. Whether it is today, tomorrow, or a thousand years after we've died and gone, it's still going to be that. That explosion of joy and release and happiness to realize the fulfillment of the hope that we have carried through our faith all our lives. That's something to be ready for and something to look forward to. Amen.